次が作るの。ブスマラハルマンラヒム。Salam alaikum everybody. In Alhamdulillah, Nahmaduhu, Wanastainuhu, Wanastafiru. When I was Billah min Shururi and Pusina, women say ye ati amalina. May ya dihilahu fala mudilala, or may you dil fala hadiala. I shall do a la ilaha illahu, Wadahu la shirikala, and a Mohammedan Abduhu or Sulhu. Ya you halazina ama not to call laha haka to Katihi, while at the mutuna illa want to Muslimoon. Ya you hennas at the Kura Bukumazi, Halaka Kumin Nafsin Wahida, or Halaka Minha Zaujaha, or Bertha Minhuma, Rijalan Kathir and Wanisaa, what to call lahi lazi to sa aluna behi while at Ham. إن الله كان عليكم ركيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا تقول الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ما يجتي الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما ربي شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأهل الأبد ذم اللسان يفقه قولي My dear brothers and sisters, I am so glad, alhamdulillah, رب العالمين, that I have another chance with you to reflect on one of the names of Allah سبحانه وتعالى. And we're really down to the last uh, three names now uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this series. This has been, for me at least, uh, a multi-year journey. And alhamdulillah, I'm grateful to have this opportunity. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows all of us uh, to benefit from the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be able to implement these names in our lives through the habits that we form and create for ourselves. So today we're going to reflect on the name Al-Baqi. And Al-Baqi means the everlasting so from among the names that we find in the Qur'an, this name Al-Baqi is not one that is mentioned directly in the Qur'an. However, the root word of this name, Ba-Qafya, does appear in the Qur'an. So we previously discussed that there are 81 names that are mentioned directly in the Qur'an. And for the remaining names, the scholars differ just a little. So this name appears in the list by Imam Al-Ghazali, and that is the list that I've been using for this particular series. And from among the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, we know about al-awwal and al-akhir. And al-awwal means the beginning and al-akhir means the end. So the name al-awwal tells us that Allah has, um, Allah was there before anything or any creation existed. And al-akhir tells us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be there when there is no other creation left. So al-baqi, the everlasting, tells us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala endures. And he, in, and he is everlasting. This means that Allah existed and continues to exist throughout time and space. So in our minds, how do we even begin to imagine what everlasting would feel like or what it would be like? We couldn't imagine that in our minds. How could we even begin to imagine what it was like before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created anything? So Imam al-Ghazali, I like the explanation that he gives about this attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the existent whose existence is necessary in itself. So Allah is the existent, meaning the thing that exists, whose existence is necessary in itself. So, the, so Allah exists because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nobody else. So when something is existent, it has a presence, a reality. Everything we see around us, all the creations are existent because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if Allah didn't exist, none of us would exist. None of these creations around us that we interact with would exist. And we as people, we didn't just appear out of thin air one day. We didn't come into existence uh, you know, just like that. We came into existence because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed us into existence. So we cannot say about ourselves that we are existent because of ourselves. That is strictly the purview of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, it would be the same uh, as us saying that we created ourselves into existence and we cannot exist without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists, we exist. Our bodies, our organs, all of these mechanisms are designed to support our life in this world. And we did not invent this design for ourselves. We didn't conceive this design before we even existed to say this is the form that we're going to take. So our form, our bodily functions are all designs from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And our bodies are dependent on the organs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us. Um, they continue to, these organs continue to function and give us the life that we know every single day. So for example, to live, we need oxygen. And 
uh, if our lungs uh, stopped functioning, then there would be no oxygen for our body and we would die. We need blood to carry this oxygen from our lungs to the rest of our body and carry the impurities away from our other organs. And if our blood clots and stops flowing, we die. We need our heart to continually beat so that it can pump blood throughout our body, which feeds our muscles that supports our movements. And if our heart stops beating, we die. So we need our brain as well to regulate all the organs inside of our body. And if our brain stops working and does not regulate our body, we die. We need hormones to regulate our emotions and our body. And if our hormones are out of balance, then we experience unpleasant symptoms or diseases and we die. And we can go on and on and on and give many more examples like this of the different ways in which if any one system in our body stopped to work, stopped functioning in the way Allah has designed it, then we, we know the end result is just death. But none of these restrictions apply to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our existence is predicated on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which means that for us to exist, there must be a higher power that exists because our existent state is not possible through our own self-determination. As Muslims, we believe that the higher power who created us is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, for Allah to exist, our existence is not necessary. So Allah is al-Baqi, the everlasting. And we can believe all we want that in this world, we are successful because of ourselves. But unless it is willed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are absolutely nothing. And we know this from the Quran. In Surah Al-Qasas, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, do not call out to any other God besides God, for there is no God but Him. Everything will perish except His face. His is the judgment, and to Him you shall all be brought back. So we should understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not bound by time. So by time, if you think about the verse that I just now recited where Allah calls, tells us coming back, there's a, a, a hint towards the passage of time and then something returning. So we should understand that Allah is not bound by time. There's no effect of time on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a, an authentic hadith reported by Abu Huraira where the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah tells, uh, Allah says, the son of Adam displeases me by abusing time, whereas I am time. I alternate the night and the day. And this is an authentic hadith you can find in Sahih Muslim. So what this tells us is time is another creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And time constantly unfolds in front of us. And nobody except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can control the movement of time. At least up to this point, we have not found a way to control time. So I think that's a pretty accurate fact to state. So the amazing thing about time is that it is a measure. We use it to measure all things around us. It is how we can tell when it's time for Fajr, or if it's time for Isha, or if it's time for Juman. It is how we can tell how old a person is. It is how we measure the number of hours we should sleep to keep our bodies healthy. So it has a component, it has a medicinal component to it. It is a measure that allows us to determine the average life expectancy and where we are today relative to that scale. So it has a social component to it, as well as a scientific component to it. It is a measure of how effectively we can manage our day. It is a measure that allows people from across the world to work together. So in that sense, it also has an application for our day-to-day -day productivity. It is a measure by which we know how long to wait for something to be done. So it is a way for us to measure how much patience we need to have or give. So when Allah tells us that it is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we waste our time, there is a lesson for us in it. Every guidance that we receive from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has wisdom for us to learn from. And one of the obvious lessons we can take away is that time is a gift. And if we spend this gift doing something that does not benefit us, then we're acting ungratefully. When we spend our time uh, pleasing the one who gave us this gift, Allah, it is acting with gratitude. It's the same way uh, as if we would thank our parents by doing something nice for them. And when we are told that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Ar-Rahim, one of the 99 names of Allah, the merciful, His mercy is not bound to the past, the present, or the future. Allah's mercy is forever. It, it, it spans 
time and space in all places that we can potentially think of and that which we don't know about. So for example, um, there's a lesson we can learn from the story of Yunus alayhi uh, salam. And we learn from the story of Yunus, uh, the qualities of mercy, forgiveness, compassion, repentance. And if you don't know the story of Yunus alayhi salam, I'll share a very quick short version of it with you. Uh, Prophet Yunus or Jonah, as well as is known in uh, English, was sent to the people of Nineveh who were idol worshippers. And Yunus alayhi salam, like all prophets, shared the message of the oneness of Allah. And he warned them about Allah's punishment. And like all prophets before Yunus alayhi salam, his people rejected him. And the people, you know, his people mocked him, his people taunted him and said, bring on the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And after taking this, um, this kind of rejection over and over again, uh, Yunus alayhi salam became frustrated and left his people fearing that Allah's punishment was destined for them. So after Yunus alayhi salam left the city, you know, a storm began to brew over the sea and was heading towards the city. So the storm didn't look like any ordinary storm. And when the people of Nineveh saw this storm, they began to remember Yunus alayhi salam had warned them about Allah's punishment. So fearing Allah's wrath and fearing that this storm would destroy them, the people uh, recognized that, you know, they could be one more example like the people of Nu or Ad or Thamud. So the people of Nineveh submitted themselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and began to pray and ask Allah for forgiveness and mercy. Meanwhile, Yunus alayhi salam had already left and was on a ship sailing away. And while he was on the ship and that storm was brewing, the ship was taking on that storm as well in the ocean. And the intensity of the storm was increasing as well. So the ship began to take on water and the ship's captain decided that it was time to unload the heavy cargo and anyone else from the passengers who was not necessary. So instead of just making the decisions, the sailors decided we're going to draw lots. Um, and we also know this from the Quran, drawing lots is, is not permissible. It's, it's stated in the Quran as well. But the sailors draw lots and uh, unfortunately Yunus alayhi salam, he drew the shortest stick, so to speak. And despite his pr protest, they threw him overboard uh, into the ocean. So as Yunus alayhi salam sank to the bottom of the sea, a whale came by, swallowed him whole, and while in the darkness of the whale's belly, Yunus alayhi salam realized the error of his ways, that he was being, um, that Allah was giving him uh, punishment for leaving his people before Allah had commanded him to. And this is where we learn about the dua of Yunus alayhi salam that is very beautiful and very powerful, where Yunus alayhi salam says, La ilaha illa anta subhanaka, inni kuntu min azal. I mean, there is no God but you, glory be to you, I was wrong. And you can find this, uh, this verse in Surah Al-Anbiya which is the 21st chapter. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave Yunus alayhi salam and commanded the whale to drop Yunus onto the shore. Now, spending time in the whale's belly, all the acids in the stomach, etc., had obviously weakened uh, Yunus alayhi salam. But in this state, even Allah's mercy didn't stop. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave shade, gave fruit to Yunus alayhi salam while he was on this island so that he could recover from his uh, injuries and so on. So what we learn from the story of Yunus is that, um, you know, patience, repentance, going back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and asking him for forgiveness. And in Surah Al-Qalam, verse number 48, we are told, um, when Allah says to the Prophet sallallahu wait patiently, Prophet, for your Lord's judgment. Do not be like the man in the whale who called out in distress. So Allah is referencing the example of Yunus alayhi salam to let the Prophet sallallahu alayhi know that be patient, don't abandon your people. And patience is not an easy virtue to come by, especially not in the world that we live in, and especially not so much more in this world that promotes instant gratification more and more through social media, through sales, and whatever else there is. So through our own desires, we seek the pleasures of this world. And that's just part of human nature. And it doesn't help our nafs when the marketing is so good these days digital marketing as well as television and all that, it's very hard to escape how well this machinery called marketing and digital marketing has us looking at products and looking at services that, that we probably don't need most of the time anyways. So the pursuit of wealth, the pursuit of happiness, the bigger homes, the bigger vehicles, the fancier vehicles, these are all distractions for us in this world. And as we learn from the Quran and from our own lived experience, we know that this world is not everlasting. So all of this that we see around us, 
and including ourselves, will come to an end when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deems it to be. And in Surah Al-Hadid, Allah tells us, uh, bear in mind that the present life is just a game, a diversion, an attraction, a cause of boasting among you of rivalry in wealth and children. So Allah is calling this, as translated in English, a game, a diversion. And if this world is a diversion, what is a God-fearing believer to do? Okay, so the believer must keep their eyes on the prize. And what is that prize? The prize is the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the same verse in Surah Al-Hadid, Allah tells us there is a terrible punishment in the next life as well as forgiveness and approval from God. So in us, Allah has created natural desires for food, for wealth, for companionship, for comfort, for security, and so on and so forth. All of these desires that we have are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he has also provided us with guidance that tells us how to attain our desires in a way that is pleasing to Allah. And we call this halal. And this is why it is important for us to set aside time to learn about what is permissible, learn about the rights of our parents, the rights of our children, the rights of our spouses, uh, the rights of our communities, our neighbors. And the Quran also warns us of what will happen if we pursue our desires in a way that is forbidden. And we call this haram. And when people engage in acts that are forbidden or haram actions to fulfill their desires, their pleasure is short-lived and is limited to this world and this world alone. And every act of kindness, every moment we act in a way that is pleasing to Allah is recorded by the angels. And these are the deeds that will carry us into Jannatul Firdaus on the Day of Judgment. So if we think about it, Allah is telling us that these good deeds survive not just this world, not just the distractions of this world, but these good deeds will survive to the Day of Judgment. And they will multiply and grow. And we know this too also from the Quran. In Surah Al-An'am, Allah tells us, whoever has done a good deed will have it ten times to his credit. But whoever has done a bad deed will be repaid only with its equivalent. So think about this. Allah is telling us that I want you to do more good deeds, which should tell us that Allah wants us all to be in genital for those. By saying there's a 10 to 1 ratio, you know, if I use the math, if you use basic math here, 10 to 1 ratio between good deeds and bad deeds. Why would we not do more good deeds? It, it's, it's almost a no-brainer, as they say. So with this knowledge, how can we do more? And that is the thought that we should, that's the seed that we should plant in our thoughts. Why, why should we not seek even more pleasure from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And inshallah, may Allah elevate our understanding of the Quran because all of this information is in the Quran. It comes from the Quran and increase us in knowledge and give us the wisdom so that we can then take this knowledge and apply it on our day-to-day lives. You know, my dear brothers and sisters, with each of these attributes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, we, we always find ways to apply it to our own lives, how we can make it easy and make it fit into our busy schedules. And that is uh, one of the last thoughts I want to leave you with is that how can we take al-baqi and how can we apply it so that we can implement it in our own lives? Um, so one way I've thought about that we can implement this in our lives is through the awareness of time. So most people will call it time management. However, I, I want to believe that we can elevate the simple concept of time management to how I think about it as priority management. Why I think in terms of priority instead of time? We do this already. You know, we don't necessarily keep tabs of times until unless we have appointments or we're between appointments. But if we think in terms of priority, which we already do, you know, the things that, that we want to get done we give them a priority and we make sure we make time for those things. So thinking about, for example, our salah and giving our salah priority, that is one way in which we can make ourselves better and implement this, uh, the learnings from this particular name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our daily lives. You know, if, if something is not important enough, we, we very easily put it aside and we say it's not as important, not a priority, I'm going to do it another day. But if we implement the actions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to us, like Salah, for example, you know, as Muslims, we must perform Salah five times a day on time. 
And there are certain windows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed, again, using the measure of time for us, giving us that ability to stay within the boundaries that Allah has created. You know, we can use this on our day-to-day um, on our day-to-day activities to say, okay, I'm going to prioritize Salah today. And we know the importance of Salah already. You know, for many of us, um, if we're rebirths and we're new, we, we first learned that Salah is one of the five pillars of Islam. And the Prophet Sallallahu tells us in authentic hadith that if there was a tent, the five pillars were a tent, the Salah would be the pole in the middle that holds the whole tent up. So it is an important pillar for us and prioritizing this in our day is very important. And it's a great way for us to also grow ourselves spiritually because if we're connecting to Allah five times a day and it takes no more than 20 minutes in an entire 24 hour day for us to complete our salah we will grow every single day as an individual uh, spiritually so another way uh, we can implement the learnings from this particular name or the attribute is through seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness repentance is a very powerful tool it is a very powerful tool we don't repent um you know, because we're excited to repent. We repent because we're reminding ourselves that the action that we may have done, no matter how big or small, is something we should try and avoid to do. And that remembrance is asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness and asking Allah to guide us and give us the strength to overcome any weaknesses that we may, we may have uh, or any past misgivings. So, you know, it's easy to to get into this also this kind of mindset that if we constantly pick on the negative, that we will we will not be able to make any progress as human beings. So it's important to remember that being desperate, uh, being hopeless, it goes against the teachings that we have in the Quran from the Prophet Sallallahu as well. So Allah doesn't prescribe hopelessness, but this is a way for us to find a way not just to forgive ourselves in our hearts because of the, the misgivings or misdeeds that we may have committed, but also then reconnect ourselves with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that we can say, you know, I leave it in your hands, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, guide me. You know, one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Ar-Rashid, you know, the best guide. So using that as a way to implement repentance in our daily lives is another way for us to connect back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in Surah Zumar, Allah tells us, God forgives all sins. He is truly the most forgiving, the most merciful. And how can we not then take advantage of that? And lastly, um, you know, we can implement this in our lives through continuous charity. And we know about charity in many, many ways, even through the hadith, even through the Quran. In one of the authentic hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, when a person dies, all his good deeds come to an end, except three. Ongoing charity, which is also called sadaqa jariya, beneficial knowledge. Once you acquire knowledge, sharing it with others. This is this is a benefit that will continue to give us because that person will do good deeds and then that those deeds come back and reflect on you. And the third way is a righteous son who prays for him. So in a world that is fast-paced and able to give us instant gratification, it's so easy to get caught up in the day-to-day. So the demands of our school, if we're students, demands of our families, if we're family people, um, our work gets in the way pretty regularly. You know, it takes most of our attention on a daily basis, even on weekends sometimes. So we should make the intention to overcome these distractions. We should surround ourselves with those who are going to remind us that the time we have in this world is limited. We are not like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are going to last forever. So by reminding ourselves that Allah is al-Baqi and we exist due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the everlasting. We should strive to make the most with the time that we have. We should remind ourselves that the doors to the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are always open and they are not bound by the past, by the present, by the future. They are not bound to our human condition. They are always open no matter what state we may find ourselves in, no matter what state the world may find itself in. And all of these are ways for us to remind ourselves that we can plan all we want, but at the end of the day, the everlasting is the best planner of all. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mercy, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy is what we should always seek, not just for ourselves, but for our community members and for the folks who might be experiencing hardship. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show them mercy, show them reprieve, uh, and give us the strength to provide for them 
and be that vehicle through which we can be that ease for them. And inshallah, may Allah give us all um, guidance, keep us on the straight path, allow us to receive Jannatul Firdaus. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us all with five spouses and offsprings who will be the joy of our hearts and make us um, models for the righteous. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive all of our sins and absolve us of our misdeeds so that we may all die as virtuous Muslims. And I ask Allah to forgive us, our parents and the believers on the day when the judgment will come to pass. Rabbana habdana min azwajina wa zuriyatina kurata ayyunin wa ja'alla al-muttaqina imama. Rabbana faghfir lana zunubana wa kafir anna sayyatina wa tawafana ma'al abrad. Rabbi jalni mukimu salati wa min zuriyati rabbana wa taqabal dua. Rabbana khfirli wa li walidiya wa lil mu'mina yawma yakum nisab. Rabbana amanna faghfir lana wa rahamna wa anta khayru rahimeen. Inna allaha ya'muru bil adli wal ihsan wa ita'i zil kurba wa yanha'in al fashai wal munkari wal baghi. Ya'izzukum la'allakum tazakkarun la ilaha illa anta subhanika. إني كنت من الظالمين سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يصفون وسلام للمرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين آمين الله السلام عليكم everybody جزاك الله عمر for again another fantastic خطبة I cannot believe that we are coming down to the last now two names three three so we have three after today yes three after today okay all right do I dare ask what theme you'll be developing after this series is over? Or are we going to start from the beginning again? I haven't thought that far. Ahead. Okay. All right. No pressure. No pressure. No pressure. All right. Oh, awesome. This is Zakala again. Um, just some a couple of quick announcements. Inshallah, this Sunday, guys, we're going to be um, hosting the Surah Halakha. My apologies for canceling last Sunday. I was just under the weather. So uh, that's 11 a.m. on Sunday. Uh, and then... Keep in mind, those of you in the Austin area, we are doing another film screening on the 29th, Sunday the 29th in the afternoon. The film is called Israelism. It's a fascinating film um, that shows th basically the power of propaganda. So I don't want to ruin it too much. Um, it's a great film, highly recommend showing up. Uh, it, it is free to attend, a $5 donation is suggested, but don't let that hold you back. You are more than welcome to join and spread the word. Seats are limited. Uh, so lock in your seat now. All the details can be found on the website. But that's all I have for announcements. Be sure to just check out the website for everything um, that we have coming up. But uh, if anyone wants to give their salam, the floor is yours. we got a quiet bunch today. No Auntie Nasreen? I'm sure she'll be catching the recording later on. All right, everybody. Good seeing you all here. Inshallah, we will be back here next Friday. Take care and have a great weekend. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam.